Good afternoon, and thank you very much for joining us again. I'll start with the usual update on today's statistics. The total number of positive cases reported yesterday was 581. That represents 3.3% of the total number of tests and takes the total number of confirmed cases in Scotland to 200,987. 161 of those new cases were in Greater Glasgow and Clyde, 105 in Lothian and 97 in Lanarkshire. The remaining cases were spread across eight other health board areas. 924 people are currently in hospital, that is 43 less than yesterday, and 80 people are in intensive care, which is a reduction of nine from yesterday. But I regret to report that 27 additional deaths have been registered in the last 24 hours of patients who first tested positive over the previous 28 days. That takes the total number of deaths registered under that definition to 7,111. Once again, I want to send my condolences to all of those who have lost a loved one. I'm joined today by our National Clinical Director, Professor Jason Leach, who will be helping me to answer the journalist's questions. Before that, there are two main issues I want to update you on. The first is about our vaccination programme. I can confirm that at, as at 8.30 this morning, 1,542,929 people in Scotland have received their first dose of the vaccine. That is an increase of 26,949 since yesterday. In addition, 8,679 people have received their second dose. And that brings the total number of people who have had their second dose to 65,340. As you know, the Scottish Government provides a daily breakdown of the numbers of people who have had their first dose. That includes figures in each of the different age groups that we've started vaccinating. From today, Public Health Scotland will begin to publish first dose statistics for all age groups. In addition, they've also refined some of the ways in which we record the age of people being vaccinated, and that should make our figures more accurate. For example, previously where someone was over 69 and a half, they would have been included in the figures for the 70 to 74 year old cohort. Under the revised system, reporting will be based on a person's age as it would be on the 31st of March. That brings us into line with the approach taken in England and Wales. And as a consequence, it also means that the percentage figures I'm reporting today are calculated on a slightly different basis from the ones previously reported. So using Public Health Scotland's revised figures, I can confirm that 94% of 65 to 69 year olds have now received a first dose of the vaccine. That is a significant increase on the percentage of 85% that we reported yesterday, and some of that increase will be due to those reporting changes. But the figure shows very clearly that we are on track to offer a first dose to everyone aged between 65 and 69 by early March. And we now expect to be able to offer a first dose to everyone over 50 and to all adults with an underlying health condition by the 15th of April. Although, as always, that is, of course, subject to supply. At that point, we move into the second phase of the vaccination programme, and this will involve vaccinating the rest of the adult population, which, again, supplies permitting, we hope to do by the end of July. This morning, the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation published advice on how to approach that next phase. They advise that we should prioritise vaccinations for the rest of the adult population on the basis of age, with 40 to 49-year-olds vaccinated first, followed by 30 to 39-year-olds, and then 18 to 29-year-olds. JCVI, of course, looked at a range of risk factors, such as occupation, gender, ethnicity, and deprivation. But they conclude 
that even among groups with a heightened exposure or vulnerability to the virus, age is still the most significant factor. On that basis, the JCVI believe that an age-based approach to vaccination is the quickest and most effective way of protecting the most vulnerable. They also advise that in logistical terms, it is the most efficient way of rolling out the vaccine to the remaining adult population. And I can confirm that together with the other governments in the UK, the Scottish Government has accepted the JCBI advice. The second issue I want to highlight relates to support for the health and social care workforce. The Scottish Government is determined to support our health and care workforce in whatever way we can, and that includes providing help for their mental health and well-being. Last year, we established a national well-being hub and a National Wellbeing Helpline to help health and care workers who need additional support. The Wellbeing Hub has been visited by nearly, uh, 80, on nearly 80,000 occasions. Today, we are formally launching a new service called the Workforce Specialist Service. It will supplement local staff support arrangements that are already in place. This service will therefore be able to provide confidential and expert care for professionals who are suffering from a range of issues, including stress, anxiety, depression or addiction. Details of how to use the Workforce Specialist Service are available through our National Wellbeing Hub, which can be accessed at www.promis.scot. So, if you're a regulated health or social services worker and feel that you would benefit from mental health treatment and care, please do find out more. Working in the caring professions is stressful at any time, and I know it has been especially difficult over the last year. We know that we need to support staff and help them to recover. That is, above all, part of our duty of care to our workforce. But it is also essential for health and social services in the months ahead. We need a strong and resilient workforce with time to recover in order to start to resume services that were paused during the pandemic. The new service is an important additional way in which we are trying to help support health and care workers at a time when they are still doing so very much to help and support all of us. Those were the two main issues I wanted to cover today. To close, I want to remind everyone once again of the current rules and guidelines. The most important rule for now remains the same. Please stay at home. In any level four area, which of course is all mainland Scotland, you must only leave the house for essential purposes. You cannot meet up with other households outdoors, indoors, and if you meet someone outdoors, you can only meet with one other person from one other household. You must work from home if you possibly can, and employers have a legal duty to support people to work from home. And when you do have to leave the house, please continue to remember facts. Wear face coverings when you're likely to come into close contact with other people. Avoid anywhere busy. Clean hands and surfaces. Use two metre distancing if you're talking to someone from another household. And self-isolate and book a test if you have symptoms. Above all else, though, please stay at home as much as possible. I know how difficult that is, and, and I really do appreciate your patience and the sacrifices I know you are making. But we need to keep going. This is a promising time, but we're not there yet. The past couple of months have seen good progress, but we really don't have any room for error right now. So it's vital that all of us continue to stick with the rules and the guidelines. That's how we make it safe to ease the restrictions more quickly. It's how we continue to protect each other while vaccination programme continues. And it's how we continue to protect our NHS and save lives. So thank you once again to all of you who are doing just that. Now let's turn to our journalists uh, who have joined us this morning and the first of those is Ross Govins from Scottish Television. 
Afternoon, uh, Cabinet Secretary. You, you mentioned that the latest GCVI uh, recommendation on the vaccination programme by age. Police and teaching unions have been highly critical of that. They're asking why aren't those uh, frontline staff being prioritised? And also uh, a warning from the, the, the BMA this morning that the NHS won't recover from the pandemic if senior staff such as consultants can't be retained, sorry, is enough being done to support staff and protect them from possible burnout? Thanks very much, uh, Ross. Two really important questions. I'll say a little bit about JCVI, but I'll ask uh, Jason to say more on that. I, I understand uh, why some of our professions uh, and our sectoral groups may be disappointed at JCVI's advice, but they are crystal clear about where the greatest risk factor lies, and it lies on age. It doesn't lie on the basis of where you work, but on how old you are, as well as if you have underlying health conditions or are clinically extremely vulnerable. We're working through those groups. It, it is the right thing for this government and indeed the other governments of the UK to follow that clinical advice, that well thought through clinical advice. And that is exactly what we're doing. Logistically, it also makes significant sense. It is straightforward for us to identify people on the basis of their age through our NHS Scotland uh, highly secure and protected records. Much more difficult to go through those records and pull out who is a teacher, who works for the police force, who does something else. That takes longer. And of course, you'll remember that what JCVI have also said from the very start is go as quickly as you can, as quickly as supplies allow to maximize the vaccination of the largest number of the adult population as fast as you can. So if you take those two together, it makes real sense uh, for the protection of all of us that we follow JCVI advice. On your second point about what the BMA uh, have said, uh, I completely uh, appreciate the BMA's point. We regularly, I regularly discuss with the BMA here in Scotland. They're part of the mobilisation recovery group that I chair. It's been going for some time, uh, as well as talking to, of course, our royal colleges uh, about their particular concerns. Uh, and all of that has been actually pre-pandemic about how do we retain expertise and experience at every level of the health and social care workforce. So there's a great deal of work underway, but as I indicated in my opening statement, I'm very conscious that a large group of our health and social care workforce have been working under significant pressure for 12 months now. And we need to be able, as we plan the recovery of the NHS for non-COVID healthcare, we need to be able to give them time to recover, to recuperate, to move to a different pace and phase of work. So that's what all the planning is in hand. Work is underway that will come to me at the end of this month. That mobilization recovery group that the BMA is an important member of uh, will look at these matters in early March uh, and we will be setting out our plans as a government about how we, I hope, because of all the work everyone is doing, are able to turn down the dial a bit in how the NHS uh, has to deal with COVID-related healthcare and turn up the dial, but not at an equal level, on how we slowly begin to bring back our health service for all non-COVID healthcare, making sure we've got a resilient and a properly supported workforce. Jason, do you want to pick up JCVI? So the JCVI press conference, I, I don't know if you watched it, but was very, very clear. The reason they've taken weeks to make this decision is because they have examined all of the evidence available to them. Occupation, sex, age, everyth all other variables that they could possibly think of to give us the best advice they could. They've done that for 30 years. We have never departed from their advice in 30 years. They have said today, those at highest risk of hospitalisation outside of cohorts one to nine are those aged 40 to 
to 49. Unvaccinated individuals who are at increased risk on account of their occupation, male sex, obesity or ethnic background are likely to be vaccinated most rapidly by an operationally simple vaccine strategy. The question, of course, is do you deprioritize a 49-year-old in order to vaccinate a 20-year-old who happens to be in a profession? The JCVI say no. They've looked at all of the evidence and they've decided the safest, risk-based, quickest way to do this is by age band on the way down. And that will be disappointing to some in some professions. Remember, my final point is that health and social care workers have an occupational exemption, not because of who they are, but because of who they look after. So if you are a 26-year-old nurse in an intensive care unit, you've been vaccinated because of the 85-year-olds in intensive care, not because of your risk. That's about the risk of those you're looking after, multiple elderly and high-risk individuals in the health and social care system. So the Joint Committee has been crystal clear this morning. The boffins have decided, and we have decided to accept their advice. Thanks very much. Uh, David Henderson from BBC. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. You're not obliged to take that JCVI advice, of course. Um, there are um, teachers um, uh, out there and shop workers and police officers who are clearly at a, a much higher risk than the rest of the population, and they're easy to identify, so they'll be wondering why they can't be prioritised. Is it really beyond the powers of the NHS to find these people in schools or police stations and get them to the front of the queue? So thanks very much, David. Uh, I'm going to return uh, to Jason uh, on this, but let me say uh, a few things about it. Uh, in 30 years, no government in Scotland has gone against the advice of the JCVI, and there's a really good reason for that. This is clinical expert advice that trawls through the data with people who have dedicated their lives to understanding how vaccines work and vaccination programmes work. And I do not think it would be justifiable, proportionate or wise for this government to cast aside the advice from that group of people. Secondly, it, it isn't the case that, as JCVI have clearly said, that any profession, anyone working in a profession, is at a higher risk because of the nature of their job. They're at a higher risk, above all, because of their age. And it's not beyond the wit of NHS Scotland. We have uh, one of the best medical records and safest and most secure uh, systems. It's not beyond our wit to trawl through that. But if you stop and think about this, it is easy to ask the system to pull out, pull out for me, everyone with a CHI record, an NHS Scotland record, who's aged between 40 and 49. System can pull that out. You say to the system, look at all the records. Now, would you like to see if in there there's anything that tells you that somebody is a police officer or a teacher or a worker in power industry? Think about what that then requires the system to do. The system could probably do it, but by the time it's done it, we would have vaccinated those 40 to 49-year-olds, booked their appointments, got them in, supplies permitting, done the job. Logistically, it's also the most sensible way to do it. Remembering that JCVI have said to us from day one, there's two things you need to do. You need to prioritize age because those are the people at most risk and you need to move as fast as you can and supplies allow you to, to vaccinate the largest number of people. Put those two together, that also works for all of us because the faster we can do that, the more we can take the kind of decisions that allow us to return slowly, step by step, to a more normal life. Jason. Let me use journalists as an example, David. That's maybe unfair, and I don't know how old you are. But what, what, what you're suggesting is you take a 49-year-old journalist vaccine and you give it to a 20-year-old police officer. The JCVI says that is the wrong way around. The deep and highest risk is age, not occupation. In fact, there's very little evidence of increased risk of hospitalization or death by occupation. 
Otherwise, the Joint Committee would have said prioritise by occupation. They could have said that today. They didn't. They chose to tell us to prioritise by age for two reasons. One, because of the risk is higher as you move down, and for speed and simplicity of implementation, which is crucial because we're going to go through those 40 to 49-year-olds from the middle of April onwards, then we'll get to everybody else. This is the fastest vaccination programme the UK has ever seen and the second fastest in the world. So we will get to all of those age groups, whether you're a police officer, a journalist or a teacher. Thank you. Uh, next is Bruce McKenzie from ITV Border. Bruce. Thank you, Health Secretary. Um, I want, wanted to ask you a little bit about um, the return of football. Obviously, that wasn't laid out for the lower tiers uh, when the roadmap was announced earlier this week. I understand the joint response group has been meeting with some of the leagues this week, and I just wondered if you were able to give us an update. With many clubs now in the lower reaches having not played a game for, for more than two months, You know, can you give them any hope that they might be able to return, or, or should they be looking to to scrap th this season at some, some levels. Bruce, thanks very much. I completely understand the, the importance of the question, but also the difficulty that people are facing. But I'm going to ask Jason uh, to pick this up. He's done a lot of work for us in this area. I can't give you a definitive answer, Bruce. I can tell you that conversations are ongoing with the Minister of Sport, Mary Goujon, and officials and some of our clinical advisors who work with me to get that back just as soon as we can. I, I don't think we yet know exactly when, but there are plans for training to commence soon. Quite a lot of variables in there. Remember, most of these lower, some of these lower leagues have quite a lot of travel, and that's one of the things we're worried about. So from Dumfries to Elgin, we're also worried about equity because the women's game has been particularly badly hit by these restrictions, and we don't want that to be the case. So we're very keen to get particularly the women's game back and it's in one of the lower league divisions of course compared to the men's league of the six layers or seven layers of the SPFL leagues so I think we'll have news very soon those conversations are ongoing today and over the weekend and I'm hopeful for an outcome that will at least allow some of that to restart soon. Thanks very much uh, Craig Payton from PA. Uh, thanks Health Secretary. Uh, in the last few days, we've seen the positivity rate below 4% uh, for, the for the past three days, I think, if my memory serves, which is obviously great news. Um, I'm wondering how long this would have to be the case for the Scottish Government to potentially bring forward re re reopening dates, maybe for schools or certain parts of the economy. Um, also, Professor Leach, you said yesterday in the COVID-19 committee that prevalence has stalled somewhat. It's sort of, I think you said around about 104 per 100,000, it's about at that level, and it's been there for the last few weeks. Um, I'm wondering how that chimes with these new figures we're seeing this week, and if we're potentially starting to see cases start to drop again. Thanks, thanks very much, uh, Craig. Uh, actually, both your questions are, the answer to both your questions is uh, all of a piece, if you see what I mean. You can't separate out rates per 100,000 from uh, those daily figures and the positivity that you're also talking about. So I'll say a little bit about that um, and then I'm sure Jason will want to say uh, some more. Uh, we, we set out, the First Minister set out very clearly on Tuesday this week, uh, the approach that we would take uh, towards uh, the end of April, where we hope uh, by that stage uh, to be able to move to uh, the levels framework, uh, possibly revised, but similar to what uh, you all have got used to uh, before uh, we entered the Christmas period. Um, and the steps that would be taken, the th importance of three weekly intervals to be sure uh, of the data that was coming forward. So the impact of uh, the uh, phased reopening in early years, uh, some of primary, very small number in uh, senior phase in secondary that started on Monday of this week uh, care home visiting, uh, indoor visiting, really important, beginning uh, in March, so beginning from towards the end of next week, I'd expect, and then all the way through. So with an indicative date that around about the 15th of March, uh, we would be able, we hoped, to move another step uh, out of lockdown. 
uh, and the First Minister set out uh, what those might be. The three-week period is really important. So while you can see uh, daily good figures, other days not so good figures, it's not a nice smooth downward line at all, uh, those are important, but we, we didn't pick three weeks randomly out of the air. We, we went on the basis of clinical advice that said you need to give it a reasonable period of time to be sure that progress is not just being made, but is being sustained. Uh, now, of course, if we see uh, even, even better reduction in case numbers and case positivity, not forgetting what the WHO uh, sets out clearly for us to be looking for as important indicators, then as we move out of lockdown into uh, other uh, stages, then we may be able to move faster. But at this point, we ha our headroom is really limited in terms of how well we have brought, we have together brought cases down, done it very well, but not yet far enough to go further than was set out by the First Minister earlier this week. Jason. Yeah, the Cabinet Secretary, you've covered it well. The the positivity rate today and for a couple of days has been good. You're absolutely right. And today's positive cases data seems good. It's less than 600. But that's because we've got used to 800s and 900s. It, if you think back to last summer, the, these numbers were much, much lower when we were beginning to get to very low numbers. The, the prevalence per 100,000, which is what I was talking about at COVID committee, is stuck. It's stuck at 100. It was 104 most of this week. It's 102 today. Today might bring that down a little bit more. Last July, on the 13th of July, it was 1.1, 1 .1, 1 .1 per 100,000. The WHO say you should try and get below 50, and then you should get below 20. We have nine local authorities below 50, and only two, Shetland and Orkney, below 20. So that 104 is stubbornly high, and masks are ranged from 219 to zero. So we have to hold our line in order to get all of them down further. Positivity also ranges from pretty much zero in Shetland and Orkney to 7% in Falkirk. So, so we m we've got to be careful not to take single days. The WHO say you should take the average over a two-week period, at least. That's an incubation period. We're adding in then a third week. The UK, England, are adding in two of them. So they are adding in five weeks altogether. And, and that's in order to give us notice to allow us to make those judgments as best we can. Thanks very much. Uh, Chris Musson from The Sun. Good afternoon, both. Um, can I just check, um, given Mark Woolhouse's comments yesterday, whether you maintain that you were close to elimination last summer? Because among other things, he essentially said that we weren't testing um, that much. And when we started testing more in August, we found more cases and then um, just just related to the test positivity issue you were just talking about obviously you set out in the exit strategy earlier this week the who thresholds for test positivity and how these might guide us towards putting certain areas in certain levels after april the 26 but the test positivity rate you're using as i understand it is not the same as the one that the who is talking about i think they talk about the, the test positivity rate for sentinel testing so random community testing and, and the one that you're using as i understand is based on a wider measure of the, the whole testing program and it could perhaps be weighted towards symptomatic people so i'm just wondering if you can address that issue whether whether you're comparing with apples with pears here thanks thanks very thanks very much chris uh, i'll let jason deal with uh, a fair bit of what you've just asked given uh, his engagement as our National Clinical Director in some of those uh, issues, particularly around the summer uh, and where we thought, uh, where we, we are confident we got to around the summer. The one, the one thing I'd say, generally speaking in all of this, uh, every single member of uh, our CMO advisory group and all of those who are actively engaged in the science around this, whether it is epidemiology or public health, uh, Every single one of them, their views and opinions are really important to us and we pay attention to them all. Uh, 
However, like any other group of individuals, when you bring them all together, they do not necessarily all share the same opinion and reach a consensus view. And often what we are trying to do as a government is listening to the individual opinions, but the consensus view as well, in order to help inform us as we make those necessary judgments. Uh, just on, on the testing point, uh, before I pass to Jason, uh, you'll know, I know you'll know, Chris, um, that we uh, have recently expanded our community-based asymptomatic testing, uh, and uh, we've got uh, uh, 20 local authorities uh, actively engaged now with us in, and there will be more to come in bringing forward their propositions about the particular parts of uh, their local authority area where they want to target community asymptomatic testing. It, it ne doesn't necessarily always stay in the same place. Uh, and uh, as of today, 15 test sites are uh, up and running in nine local authorities. The rest will come on board. And we're also uh, looking at particular um, areas of, if you like, the necessary infrastructure in Scotland. So food processing is one of those we're working with employers and my colleagues elsewhere in government. We're looking to see if we, if uh, using asymptomatic testing and the significant uh, additional capacity that we have, whether we can also uh, help those critical parts of the infrastructure of Scotland, but at the same time uh, be chasing down and identifying uh, positive cases where they exist and acting then in order to prevent uh, transmission and wider outbreaks. Uh, and uh, uh, we're very happy to make sure that everyone is kept up to date with that. My colleague, Marie Goujon, who, as one of the health ministers, leads on testing, uh, I think plans to make sure that Parliament is updated on all of that work very soon. Jason. Thanks. And Chris, so I disagree with Mark. You may not be surprised to hear that. That's healthy. That's, that's a good thing in the scientific advisory community. Some of the other members of our advisory group also disagree with Mark. Again, healthy, that's good. We rarely play those scientific debates out live at parliamentary committees and live on TV, and that's the nature of the pandemic. But let me illustrate to you why I disagree with them with data. There were two positives recorded on the 12th of July, two in the whole country. Now, we weren't testing as much as we're testing now. That point is fair, but we were testing a lot. Admissions, not based on testing, remember. Admissions, people with disease, we only had nine in seven days the week of the 18th of July. Nobody was admitted to intensive care with COVID. Nobody from the 18th of June to the 7th of July. So we had nobody ventilated for COVID disease for three weeks, from mid-July to mid-June to the beginning of July. And nobody died of COVID for a month between the 17th of July and the 18th of August. Nobody died of COVID between the 17th of July and the 18th of August, 28 days after a positive COVID test. During the period from the 17th of July to the 30th of August, so that's a six week period, we imported a whole load of new strains. We know that from the genomic testing study that we've published. 61% of those import events were from England, 28% were from Europe, and 9% were from Asia. Of course, we also shared what virus we had with others. That's not a one-way street. And I've already used my final data point already in an earlier answer. We got to 1.1 per 100,000. We're now at 104 per 100,000. Your point about positivity is a good one. We're looking at how to make that data point better. The WHO have a variety of ways that they give you for counting positivity. One is Sentinel, one is all tests, one is with PCR, one is with LFDs added in. So we try and get that as accurate as we can to make that judgment. However, it's important to say that no advice is ever given on one piece of data. The WHO say you should use prevalence, positivity, hospitalization, and death as your top four. They then have multiple other versions underneath that of everything else you should do, of course, about communicating with your public, about making workplaces safe, but those four always go together. So even if positivity gets to 1% or 0.1%, if your prevalence is 100 per 100,000, then you're still in trouble. So you have to add all those things together, and that's the advice we give to the politicians. Thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, Mark McLaughlin now from The Times. 
afternoon both. Um, I want to stick with Mark Wilhouse uh, for, for Jason. Um, I just want to check, do you also disagree with his comment that um, three quarters of people who died in the first wave caught it after lockdown and, and the lockdown may be deadlier um, than the virus, the cure may be worse than the disease, was, was what he said. I also want to ask about the vaccines. Um, I think we're going to get some more data today on health board breakdowns and, and local authority breakdowns of um, the, the vaccination rollout. Now, I've noticed something similar between Edinburgh and London, and both seem to be bottom of the respective tables. And I suspect this may be down to the fact that they've got fewer old people, fewer old people and, and a, a higher transitory young population. That's my suspicion. Can, can you maybe confirm that, um, Professor Leach? Thanks very much, uh, Mark. Um, let me take your point about uh, Lothian, actually. Uh, part of the... Uh, so Lothian is a percentage in terms of vaccinating uh, the population as a percentage of uh, the population, how they were doing, uh, uh, was much lower than... wasn't the only one, but it was lower than uh, other uh, boards. It's caught up a bit, still uh, a little bit lower than other boards. Uh, in part, that is because at the outset of the vaccination programme, uh, there were a higher proportion of care homes in Lothian with an outbreak. And of course, as you know, uh, when that is the case, you can't go in and vaccinate those care homes until that outbreak is contained and the residents and so on are, are recovering. Uh, so you can't vaccinate people when they are unwell in that way. Um, so that, that held Lothian back a bit compared to other uh, parts of the country. On your point about is it the case that Edinburgh, for example, uh, specifically in NHS Lothian, has a lower population of older people and a higher population, therefore, of younger people? I don't know that um, standing here in front of you, but I'm very happy from the census work that we do just, just to go and, and look at that. Uh, and confirm uh, whether that is the case or not, compared to, for example, uh, the city of Glasgow or Dundee or wherever, uh, where we uh, might see a different uh, picture. Uh, so we'll have a look at that and, and get back to you later. And Jason, do you want to pick up on uh, Professor so, so the second point I wasn't going to be able to answer, so I'm glad you've said you couldn't either. So I, I wasn't absolutely sure. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know the answer to the, to the age demographic of each health board. I have seen percentages of every health board, and it's very high. There are, of course, differences in there that, that may be a result of demographic. It may be that some places have slight groups that were, we are struggling to get to a little bit more than them coming to us. So some of it might be accountable for that. I, I, I agree with Mark's data. I don't agree with Mark's premise. So if he tells me 75% of the deaths have happened after you lock down on the 23rd of March, then I'm, I'm not going to argue with that. But the point is, what would have happened if you hadn't? I mean, let, let's go to Brazil briefly and see what happens when you don't do a 23rd of March lockdown. Your, your curve continues to rise exponentially and many, many more people die. Lockdown doesn't stop the disease in its tracks the day you start it. Evidenced now by lockdown number two being very gradually affecting the prevalence. It takes a long time for human behavior and the incubation period of this nasty virus to coincide and you to get down. I, just to quote you those June and July figures again, from the 23rd of March, three months later, before we got to no admissions, no deaths, no intensive care. So, so that's a long period, but it's not as if we had another option. There wasn't a, there wasn't a drug we could give that would make it go quicker. So I'm not sure Mark wants to do instead of the lockdown. Thanks very much. And just one other point on the vaccination programme before we move on, because um, it touches to something that is quite important that we've not spoken about so far. And that is what do we need to do to make the vaccination programme as inclusive as possible? Um, that is about how do we make sure that the vaccination programme reaches people, fellow citizens who uh, perhaps are homeless or are part of the travelling community or are struggling with addiction issues, um, who are not going to find it as easy to turn up at the vaccination clinic at you know, 2.20 on a Tuesday. 
There's a lot of work going on with our colleagues in the third sector uh, and the independent sector as well as uh, local government to use their expertise and help to make sure that we can get, we can maximise the reach as we've done uh, so far with uh, those uh, age-based groups uh, and health and social care workers that we've been vaccinating. We've maximised the reach into those groups greater than we thought we could, but we need to make sure that our programme is as inclusive as possible. And as we move down the age groups following the JCVI advice, we'll also be looking at whether we need to uh, increase our information, change our public communication in order to make sure that the younger age groups also understand and come forward uh, about how important it is to be vaccinated. Uh, so next is Georgina Hayes from Daily Telegraph. Thank you both. Uh, Professor Mark Gorehouse also said yesterday that gradually easing restrictions, as the government obviously plans to do over the coming weeks, uh, and eliminating the virus, they're contradictory goals. Um, and he also said that elimination of the virus in Scotland is basically unattainable, and that at the very least it would require many months of further restrictions and indefinite border closures. Um, I was wondering if you agree with that assessment, but also is the Scottish government still pursuing the strategy of eliminating COVID, or is the goal more to drive down cases and deaths and learn to live with the virus as we get back to normal? Thank you. So let me say a, a couple of things about that, because I, I think there's, there's a, a couple of false choices in there. Uh, and then I ask Jason uh, to say uh, anything more he wants to about um, some of the points you're, you're putting. Um, I, I wonder at, sometimes at the, the, the prospect of living with the virus. I'm not sure what, what that actually would mean. If that means living with people being uh, hospitalized in ICU and dying, and our NHS under considerable pressure uh, uh, in any sense of significant numbers, I, I don't think that's uh, what I'm comfortable with at all. And I think the, the goal of, the, of this government hasn't changed. It is to suppress the virus to the lowest possible level. Now, you can't eradicate it, and we are one part of an island which has other governments in it who will, quite rightly, take their own policy positions about how they want to handle um, a health situation, uh, given that health is devolved. So we need to find a way for those four nations of the UK to work together as best as we possibly can. But we've not moved away from a position that says our objective collectively with the citizens of Scotland is to suppress the level of this virus as low as we possibly can and then really let test and protect come into its own so that it can quickly identify where positive cases exist, test and protect, contain them, eliminate them, stop it transmitting. That is the way that you do that, but you can only do that effectively when you've brought the level of cases right down. Jason. I, th I think I'm, I feel like I'm repeating myself. We, we've done it already. We did it in the summer. We didn't eliminate the virus, but we maximally suppressed it. We had a month with nobody dying of COVID, three months after a lockdown. So you don't have to do it indefinitely. You do have to do it very carefully and for quite a long period, and that has other harms. I completely understand that's about schools and businesses and the economy. But the way to get them open is to get that prevalence down and then reopen safely. And crucially, don't import new variants. Don't do what we did in September, October, November and go back up again. Now, that might seem difficult. It may seem impossible. I, I, I'm unclear what the alternative is. The alternative is to say, OK, we're going to allow this number of deaths this number of hospitalizations and this number of cases. And I don't think we're in that position yet. It may be in the fullness of time when we live with this virus in an endemic way that that will be something we do. But a flu season kills 9,000 approximately. This COVID season has killed 120,000. That's unacceptable. Thank you. Uh, next is Alexander Brown from Scotsman. Thanks, Health Secretary. With the election now just 69 days away, many will still be worried about the prospect of campaigners at the door, leaflets through the post, or having to just simply go out near others to vote. 
what reassurances can you offer on these concerns? And can you outline any measures you'd like to see at, say, polling stations? Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Alexander. I know that the Electoral Commission has provided some um, public health-based guidance uh, about what it thinks uh, needs to happen, and of course it is entirely proper that they would do that. Uh, and it will be around um, making sure that in polling stations uh, that there is all that physical distancing uh, there that's there, that there is regular uh, proper cleaning, that hand sanitizer is there. And of course, there is a great deal of encouragement to people to think about taking a postal vote this time for this election, and perhaps in the past not something that they would have done. Um, uh, there's also work underway uh, with all the parties uh, looking at uh, what might be the, the options on campaigning for political parties, for individual candidates in the run-up to election. It, it will, for certain, be very, very different from what it was in 2015-16 when I was standing uh, for election. And I know that uh, Jason has... Uh, offered some engagement and some advice in all of that, and he may want to say a bit more about what, what the options are around at this point, although no decisions have, uh, have been taken, because, of course, if you think about how the weeks pan out, it is close to, the, to polling day on the 6th of May, but there is a parallel uh, exercise underway, which is what the First Minister outlined on Tuesday, and how we expect to see uh, case numbers and so on coming down. So that may make some things possible that a month ago didn't feel as if they were possible at all. But none of this is confirmed just yet for those who are standing as candidates and how campaigns might run. Jason. You know, two layers of advice really briefly. The Electoral Commission advice is really good. That's UK wide. That will be for other elections that will be happening not only the Scottish one, and then Scottish advice, which the clinical leaders in the country are fully engaged with. We've had conversations this week with those in charge of thinking about what that election might look like, from leafleting to door-to-door -door canvassing to polling stations and uh, candidates and agents who will be around those polling stations, and then how to make the counts safe uh, into the evenings. And all of that will be done according to the prevalence at the time. So we are preparing for what it would look like if the prevalence is like today, and we're also thinking about what it would look like if by then the prevalence is much lower, which we all hope it will be. Thanks very much. And our last journalist today is Richard Percival from the Daily Express. Um, thank you, Health Secretary. Um, just two questions, if I may, please. Um, firstly, former Prime Minister Gordon Brown has said in a Scottish Fabian report today that um, the lack of there's the lack of cooperation between um, both your the Scottish government and the UK government um, uh, on coronavirus policy, and he's claiming that it's making the UK look like a dysfunctional state. Um, without going too much into the politics of it, so I was just wondering what your thoughts on that were. And secondly, for Professor Leach, I'm just wondering what um, you may have seen calls by Douglas Ross and Alistair Jack for public health officials to front um, the Scottish government briefings from the end of March during the um, during the election period. Would you be willing to do this? Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Richard. Um, with respect to Mr. Brown, I, I'm not. I've not seen what he said, uh, so I have no idea what he might uh, be basing that on. What I do know is that for the past twelve months, and indeed for longer, uh, I have had. Uh, if not weekly, then contact every 10 days or so with my counterpart, Mac Hancock uh, for England, Von Gethin for Wales and Robin Swan for Northern Ireland. That's four health ministers meeting at least every week, uh, sometimes maybe 10 days, uh, but generally speaking, every week, talking about um, our overall strategy, how our numbers are going, what we're we doing about vaccination, how do we, for example, today, all four nations agreeing to go with the JCVI uh, guidance on what we do on the next phase of the vaccine programme, uh, making sure that we are cooperating on testing, including a significant expansion of testing, but also dealing with the very specific problems sometimes that have come up where there have been glitches in one lab or another lab. That's just politicians. Behind that are four CMOs, 
the clinical groups that Jason here standing beside me are involved in. The clinical groups our chief nursing officer uh, and our chief pharmaceutical officer are involved in. What our officials are doing day in and day out uh, in engagement across the four nations uh, around all of those particular programmes. So uh, our objective has always been, as a Scottish government, to maximise where we can the cooperation between the four nations, but recognising that we have a particular responsibility to take the decisions we think are right for Scotland, just as Matt Hancock has a responsibility to take the decisions he thinks are right for England, Vaughan for Wales, Robin for Northern Ireland. So I, I'm, I'm not sure where uh, Mr Brown uh, bases his view on, uh, but none of this denies the fact, of course, that there are different political perspectives. But what I think has been shown is a capacity to focus on what matters. And what has mattered for the last 12 months is the pandemic that is coronavirus 19, and how do we, as safely as we can, steer our countries through that? Jason. So I can tell you from my perspective, for question number one, the clinical advice is based on the same science across the four nations. We meet every Tuesday night, about 16 to 20 of us, all of the people who do my job, the people who do Gregor's job, the people who do Fiona's job across the four countries. And we gather that advice and then we feed it into our uh, government machines and a set of decision makers in those four countries then make choices. The second, to your second question, the First Minister and I were asked that uh, this time last week, I think, and she didn't hand me the question. That was the difference last week. But we did say that it's not a matter of whether I'd be willing, it's a matter of whether I'd be allowed. I'm not sure if she meant her permission or somebody else's. I, that's flippant. The actual answer is, of course, in the pre-election period, public health advice will be crucial. We've now decided there will be two very important moments during that pre-election period where the country will need to know what's happening with levels, what's happening with openings, and the parliament, the powers in charge of that, will have to make some choices about what that should be. For my part, and I think I can speak for Gregor, we will be available for public health advice, not for the politics, but for the straight science and the public health advice to be available during that pre-election period, however people decide that should be done. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jason. And uh, that's the last of our journalist questions this morning. So can I thank them for joining us? Uh, can I thank uh, Robert, who's our BSL interpreter today, uh, and thank Jason too, of course, for joining me. But most of all, can I thank you for taking the time again uh, to tune in to this particular coronavirus briefing. Let, let me leave you uh, before the weekend uh, with uh, my very best wishes for uh, decent weather um, and the best weekend that you can, remembering uh, the really important uh, advice and the rule that matters most at the moment, which is please stay at home. Please stay at home. Please make sure that when you have to leave the house for essential purposes, uh, or for including exercise, that you remember facts, that you wear face coverings, you avoid uh, crowded places, you clean hands and hard surfaces, uh, you stay two metres away, uh, from anyone you might be talking to or maybe in the same uh, place with, the supermarket or whatever it might be, and that you uh, self-isolate and book a test. I, I don't have words to express how much I know how difficult this is and how wearied we are all becoming of it. But what I do know is that we are seeing progress. We're seeing progress slowly, not as fast as we'd like for sure, but progress in the number of cases and in how we're beginning to uh, get ahead a bit of where the virus is. And we're certainly seeing progress in our vaccination programme. So if we just stick with it for now, deep breath, hold on to it, 12 months of really hard sacrifice and difficulty, a bit more to go, but I really do believe that will be worth it. So please stick with it. Thank you very much for doing it. Have the best of the weekend you can. Stay home, protect the NHS and save lives. Thank you very much.